welcome. Um, we're happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Cindy Lopez, and I'm the Director of Community Connections here at CHC. And Community Connections is, uh, the work we do is around community education, community engagement. So sessions like tonight um, are all part of um, what we do in Community Connections at CHC. So we have a lot of programs going on. Um, through Community Connections, I'm just gonna, going to talk for a minute about, uh, give you a little bit more information about CHC. So CHC has been here in our community for about 65 years. And um, we're um, really thrilled to be able to serve our community and meet the needs of our community, specifically serving families, teens, children, teens, and young adults. Um, we have, um, four areas of expertise here. So it's learning differences such as dyslexia, um, ADHD, uh, anxiety and depression, and autism. So those are our four areas of expertise. And so we have, and we, d we serve the community in those areas through four different divisions. So one is community connections, which you're all experiencing part of tonight. We have two schools, Sand Hill School and EBC School. Sand Hill School is a school for a private school, tuition-based private pay for kids um, for with learning and attention issues, so like dyslexia and ADHD. Esther B. Clark is our other school here, um, and it's a it's a different student population. So they their students are um, have more emotional um, issues that come out in more behavioral kinds of ways. And districts actually contract with EBC to send students there when they don't have the services for them, the appropriate services for them. So those two schools, Community Connections and the clinic. So Christina Young, who is um, going to be the presenter tonight sharing with you, is a neuropsychologist in our clinic here at CHC. Our clinic is made up of psychologists, psychiatrists, neuropsychologists, um, behavior people, uh, speech and language pathologists, uh, occupational therapists, all those kinds of people that you need um, to help you and support you around your kids and their developmental issues. So um, we also do, s we also have several different events and this thing I'm holding in my hand um, is EdRev, we have our EdRev Expo coming up May, Saturday, May 4th. It's at AT&T Park. I should be calling it Oracle now, I guess, um, at Oracle Park um, on Saturday, May 4th. It's a, it's a completely free day. Um, it's for families, um, kids, educators, parents, um, focused on the one and five with learning and attention issues plus the anxiety that comes with that. Um, there are sessions, all kinds of sessions for parents. There's activities on the field for the kids to participate in. We do free parent consultations, 30 minute pa parent consultations. So there's all kinds of opportunities there and resources for you um, to find out more um, and get the kind of support that you need for your kids. So I am going to turn it over to Christina. So um, Dr. Young, um, we're really excited that she can share with you tonight about psych ed evaluations. How many of your kids have had a psych ed evaluation done? Okay, great. So I assume that you're coming here tonight because you probably look at it and think, what is this and what should I be doing? What do I pay attention to? So Christina's gonna answer all your questions. So thank you. I also just wanted to highlight this flyer. So we have a new series of classes coming up for um, parents of kids, kids with executive functioning challenges. Um, it's a series of three classes. Um, there will be a series up here in Palo Alto and then another series in our South Bay campus. So um, if you have a kid with challenges uh, with organization, time management, um, self-monitoring, so making sure that, uh, you know, double-checking their work for errors and things like that, um, keeping track of multiple tasks, um, classes and, and coursework, this is, the, this is the workshop for you, so. Um, so it sounds like most of you are parents that have um, been through the psychoeducational evaluation process. Um, how many of you got the evaluation through the school district, your local school district? Okay, and then how, okay, so most of you, and then private, 
practitioners? Okay, so both. Some of you have both. Some of you have half and half. So you've already been through the process, and um, you have a report and a plan moving forward. Um, so I'm guessing that most of you maybe have a question about the report itself and interpreting the report. Okay, we're going to go over everything. So um, we're going to kind of talk about the whole evaluation process. Um, most of my experience is in um, clinics like this, in private practice, and in medical centers. So I have not worked th um, through the district, but I have had a lot of interactions with school districts and IEP teams and um, those reports. So we're, gonna, we're just going to kind of go through the whole process together. Um, so. Uh, we're, we're briefly going to talk about when should I seek an evaluation for my child. Since most of you have, have gotten evaluations, you, you probably have a good idea of that. Um, we'll talk also about um, who provides psychoeducational evaluations. So there are several options, and I think um, sometimes for parents it can be a little confusing about the differences and um, you know, when to go to a school psychologist versus a neuropsychologist versus an assessment psychologist. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what does the evaluation process look like? So since most of you have been through the process, we'll just talk really briefly about the different steps and appointments and things that typically occur. Um, and then we will dig into the report and talk about the main components. Um, so usually, the report opens with presenting problems, um, relevant history, so medical history, developmental history, academic history, social emotional history. Um, and then typically there is this super long results section that goes on and on forever for pages and pages. So we'll talk about that and why that's in there. Um, and then uh, the impressions and diagnoses, so tying these three elements together um, to provide kind of a holistic, comprehensive picture of strengths and weaknesses and whether or not those fall into diagnoses. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And finally, the recommendation section. Um, and then we're also going to talk about, OK, so I've done the evaluation. I have the report. What are the next steps? What are, this, what are the implications for my child moving forward as they apply to high school, as they apply to college, things like that. And um, I'm going to ask you all to hold your questions to the very end. Um, and we'll have plenty of time for questions, okay? So first, when should I seek an evaluation? Um, often um, parents seek evaluations because uh, those that work with their child, so teachers, uh, speech language pathologists, OTs, um, they express concern about development. Maybe it seems like um, your child is a little bit behind than they, sh uh, they should be. Uh, Maybe they're struggling to learn in a specific area or across the board, um, or there are social emotional concerns. So maybe um, the child seems depressed or anxious or is having difficulty connecting to other kids. Um, another reason is um, it might be something that you or the teachers observe that your child is really bright, but for some reason, uh, their grades or their performance in school just isn't matching their abilities. So figuring out what those barriers are that are preventing them from being their best, showing their, their potential. Uh, another reason, you know, maybe they do well with schoolwork and homework, but they struggle on tests. So there's something about being tested that is um, preventing them from really demonstrating what they know. Um, Another reason would be, you know, maybe your child does have a diagnosis already, and maybe they've been evaluated, and you've put a plan into place with teachers and therapists, but uh, your the providers feel stuck. They feel like um, for some reason the child isn't making progress as they should. So maybe we need to dig into this a little deeper and figure out if there's anything that we're missing. Um, let's see. And then uh, just the last point here, maybe your child's difficulties are persisting, and you know. It's, it's not unusual for a kid when they're learning a new skill or they're entering a new grade to have a little difficulty in the beginning, but if they're still lagging behind after a month or two, that's when you might consider getting an evaluation to see what's holding them back from, from achieving, from progressing. Okay, so who provides psychoed evaluations? Public school districts. The great thing about this is that it's free. Um, 
usually it's a school psychologist with a master's degree or a doctorate in school psychology, which is different than clinical psychology. Um, the focus of the school district evaluation is to determine eligibility. So there are 13 criteria or 13 eligibility categories. Um, these are just examples of some of the, the more common ones. Um, but also there's deafness, blindness, um, but autism, specific learning disability, emotional disturbance. Um, those are what the ones we most often see um, in a psychoed evaluation here. And then in the end, the, the 504 plan or the, IEP, the independent educational plan is developed um, by the IEP team with um, input from parents and whoever's working with the child. So most often when I've seen public uh, school district evaluations, um, they don't include detailed recommendations because that's something that the team is going to formulate together. Um, and that's, that's uh, you know, whereas in a private evaluation, you'll have the recommendations at the end of the report. And typically, with a school district evaluation, you're not going to get a formal diagnosis. You're going to get the eligibility um, that your child falls under, if they fall under any of the, the categories. OK, so psychologists and neuropsychologists. Um, so these are individuals with a doctorate in psychology or a PhD, doctorate of philosophy, and a license in clinical psychology. Um, most often, you will find psychologists and neuropsychologists in mental health clinics like CHC or private practices. Um, for neuropsychologists specifically, they may have board certification in neuropsychology. So that's a formal, um, a formal board certification process where they need to do a two-year uh, postdoctoral training in neuropsychology, usually in a medical center, um, and then they have to take a, a written and oral test. So I'm in that I'm in that process right now. So I'm not board certified yet, but I'm getting there. Typically, there is a broader assessment of the child's strengths and weaknesses. Um, the, the goal of the assessment is a little broader in that we're not just looking to see if they meet eligibility criteria for services or accommodations, but we're just, it's really to get a, a, a full picture of your child's strengths, um, areas that they may need help in, and um, whether or not they meet uh, criteria for a psychiatric diagnosis. And um, when I say psychiatric diagnosis, that includes things like specific learning disorder, ADHD, autism. The scope of recommendations tends to be broader because the focus of the assessment is broader. So it's not just how do we help our ch this child succeed in school, but if there are you know, interpersonal issues within the family, um, you might recommend family therapy, for example. Um, if there are, you know, need to develop social skills, we might recommend a social skills group. So there's a broader scope in um, community recommendations. And then um, also psychologists and neuropsychologists um, are able to provide formal diagnoses, um, which can be important for um, getting reimbursed by insurance. Um, and uh, standardized testing uh, accommodations. So sometimes having that formal diagnosis can kind of help with, with those things. Okay, so then a couple more. Um, so there are also uh, a kind of a growing uh, profession is school psychologists in private practice. Um, usually they have a master's or PhD in school psychology. Um, they typically assess, have training in assessing intelligence, ac academic skills, and social emotional functioning. Um, and they may have training in neuropsychological measures. Um, it's typically not as intense as the neuropsychologist, but they may have some training on those tests. And um, depending on their training and experience, there are some school psychologists that um, do diagnose learning disability in ADHD, but it just, it just depends on their training and experience. Um, and then there are private practice learning specialists or educational therapists. Um, so they typically have a master's degree, usually in education. Um, the evaluation typically focuses on academic skills. So they do not do intelligence testing, you know, like the, the Wexler scales, for example, but they focus on academic skills. And often um, they, they, they also provide intervention or assessment. So they'll do educational therapy or um, um, 
tutoring, for example. Okay. So then the evaluation process, um, we'll go through this quickly since most of you have been through this already, but usually it starts off with um, you filling out a background questionnaire and the provider doing a record review. So academic records, medical records, um, the goal is to get as much background information as possible before we meet with you in person because we want to know, um, you know, we're already starting to formulate the, um, our conceptualization of what's going on with your child and history is, is very, very important. So we want to get as much of that as we can. Um, and then the parent interview. So um, the provider will meet with parents to dig a little deeper. Maybe some things stood out um, from the, the history review. Um, maybe the parents have specific questions. So that's what I, I want to know, what the parents want to know, what the school is asking, um, what, what the concerns are. Um, so that's what we go over in the parent interview. Um, testing sessions, very, I mean, the, the hours of testing vary so much from provider to provider. So some may be as little as four hours, some may be as much as 12 hours. It depends on who you go to. Um, but in, um, but the amount of testing should be tailored to the questions that are being asked. So a good assessor will be parsimonious in their test battery, meaning they're not just going to throw a bunch of tests at a child for the sake of testing for 12 hours. The battery should be designed to answer questions and to dig deeper into areas of concern. Okay, so I think that's important. So for example, if you get a report back and it has a list of tests, um, whoever tested your child should be able to justify why every one of those tests was given. Um, and then of course is the feedback session um, where um, the provider will go over um, the results and their clinical impressions and um, the treatment plan that they've written up. And um, For kids that are old enough, um, in my practice and here at CHC, we always encourage them to have a separate feedback session or attend the session as well because that can be very empowering for kids to know what their strengths are and also know how the adults in their life are going to be supporting them in their areas of weakness. Okay, um, and then uh, you, you know, after, usually at the feedback session or shortly after, you get the report, which is basically just a very detailed uh, write-up of the whole evaluation. And then following that, um, the school feedback session or IEP meeting, where parents and the evaluator um, and the school team, you know, work together to come up with a plan for their for their kid. Okay. So let's talk about the report. Um, some of them can be up to 30 or 40 pages long, and it can be quite daunting for parents to digest. So my advice is to start at the end. Start with the impressions and recommendations section. Okay, because this is where. Um, all the history, the test results, and behavioral observations should be nicely summarized um, and integrated to provide you with a comprehensive, cohesive story of your child, um, how they think, how they learn, and how they can be best supported. Um, when you read the impression section, you should be able to um, summarize in your own words, what the, the um, provider is trying to communicate about your child. If you can't do that, you need to go back to that provider and ask for clarification because that is the goal of the report. And if the report is not achieving that, um, the provider needs to, um, to, to provide additional guidance. Does that make sense? So um, yeah, it's really important. The impression section needs to make sense to you and to anyone that reads it. And unfortunately, sometimes that can be a problem. Um, it, also, it also should directly answer your referral question. So if the referral question is, does my child have ADHD or does my child have dyslexia, the impressions section needs to answer your question, yes or no, and why. Um, so uh, when you're reading through the report, just you know, look, look for those elements in there. Then there are, after the impressions section, there's usually a list of diagnoses, and by the time you've gotten to the diagnoses, you will have read the impressions, which explain why the child was given those diagnoses. Um, and then the next section is recommendations. So the recommendations, 
Um, there, it's an action plan to support your child's weaknesses and capitalize on their strengths. That's what all those um, recommendations should be doing. Um, they should be tailored to your child uniquely, um, and um, they should be manageable, something that you know, you'll be able to implement. The other thing um, that, the, the second point here I think is really important <laughs> is whatever accommodations are recommended, they should be scaffolding rather than crutches. And what I mean by that is um, when your child has a disability or a learning disorder or ADHD, they are um, by default at a disadvantage compared to typically developing kids in the classroom, right? So they're let for, for you know, for because of inattention or because of their learning disability, they are not able to access curriculum in the classroom as easily as other typically developing kids. So accommodations are designed to level the playing field. And that's actually the, the, the formal um, terminology um, with, with other kids. Now, you don't want it, it's really, it's a fine balance between leveling the playing field and giving you know, your kid an advantage over the typically developing kids. Because the goal of, of recommendations and accommodations, it's, it's to, to, be, to level the playing field, but also to support um, your child's development and skills and their independence, and that's really important. Um, sometimes parents will ask for the whole boatload of recommendations, but that's not necessarily what's best for their child. It might raise their grade, but in the end, it may not be teaching, you know, it, they may be capable of developing a skill set without those, some accommodations in place. Does that make sense? Okay. Now we're starting, we're going to the beginning of the report, and I'm just gonna talk through these, and it, you know, really quickly. Um, so usually the first section of the report is the presenting problems and history. So you know most of this stuff already. It's basically everything that you've shared with the provider, um, your concerns, um, you know, medical, developmental history, stuff from, from records. Um, so, you, you already know the content and it should be presented in an organized, clear way so that someone else reading it really understands who your child is and what the background information is that brought them to uh, the point of needing an assessment. Um, yeah, documents concerns, documents history that's relevant to answering the referral question. Um, and, you know, it is still important to review for accuracy because it is something that is going to be passed on to people that will be working with your child. So. Um, it's totally acceptable if you find something in the history section that is not accurate, or maybe you feel that you were misrepresented when you were discussing your concerns. It's totally acceptable to discuss that with the provider and ask for the report to be amended. Okay, so the results section. Um, I consider the results section optional reading um, because it just goes, not all the time, but for many reports, it just goes into laborious detail about every single test that your child was given. And um, realistically, most people don't need that information to, to understand your child because everything that you need to know, the important stuff should be in the impressions. Okay, and then, um, so these are the domains that are typically assessed and will be typically discussed um, during, um, in the results section, so overall intelligence, usually, so that's like the Wexler um, intelligence scale for children, the Wexler preschool and primary scales, um, and that is just general um, intellectual ability. And the reason why most practitioners provide that is because we use it as a baseline to compare all these other skills. So if intelligence is average, then attention, executive functioning, learning memory, academics, we expect those to be average as well. Um, attention is um, commonly assessed because ADHD tends to be a, a big um, referral question. Executive functioning goes hand in hand with um, attention. Usually if there are challenges with attention, there are challenges with executive functioning as well. Um, they're mediated by the same part of the brain, so they typically go hand in hand. Um, then there's learning and memory, so how well does my child learn and absorb and retain information over time? Academics, of course, typically it's uh, reading, writing, and math uh, because uh, those three skill areas um, serve as kind of the foundation for like science and, and things like that. Um, and then social-emotional functioning, which um, can interact with any, 
any of these domains here. So it's always important to assess um, to see if anxiety or depression um, are playing a role in, in learning or attention. What's the name of the text that has the social emotional I mean, there are a lot. Yeah, um, sometimes they come in the form of rating scales. Mm -hmm. So you might get sent a rating scale home, like the um, behavior assessment scale for children or um, the um, children's depression inventory. It's a very long list. Um, so that usually it's either rating scales that teachers and parents and the child complete or um, more projective tests, which involve, you know, it, drawing, it's called a projective because it's very open-ended and the psychologist analyzes what the child produces to determine if there are any um, problems here. So for example, um, I, you know, one that I give a lot is um, child in rain, where I ask the child to draw a picture of a child in the rain, that's it. And based on what they choose to draw, how they draw it, what order they draw it in, you can um, you know, get a sense of how they deal with stressors how supported they feel, things like that. So it's usually rating scales and projectives, how we measure social emotional functioning, as well as just interviewing the kid and observing them at school and um, talking to parents as well. And with the intelligence test, for the primary school, is it different than for the elementary school kids mm -hmm. than um, middle school kids versus? No, so, so there are three intelligence tests by Wexler that are used the most. There is one that goes from ages two to seven, another one goes from six to 16, and then the adult one goes from 16 to like 90. So it'll usually be one of those three, depending on how old your kid is. So if you're, like, let's say 100 is considered a 50, 50 percentile, right? Yes. Over there. So let's say you have someone write exact at 100, let's mm -hmm. say average. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that the attention is going to be also average? Like that's what expected? And is that something that's considered doable? Or when do you know that, okay, there's an average intelligence, so that the academics are going to be average. So you know what, I have an average kid, and that's fine. Like, you know, mm -hmm. is that what, what you decide? Or is that when you look, you say, okay, I have above average IQ, but then I notice that attention is at the 25 percentile. Is that when you have, okay, that's ADHD. I have a bright yeah. child, but then attention. ADHD. What is that, how is that relationship work? Uh, so that's a big question, and it's the answer is gonna vary a lot depending on the kid, and depending on the referral question, and depending on the kid's environment and whether or not testing is considered valid. So that's a huge question, but that's the kind of question that your provider should be able to answer um, about your child after the assessment. So if you feel that you know, those questions haven't been addressed and that you're, you're still confused about what the scores mean, then it's really important to go back to the provider and say, you know, I need clarity on this, because um, that's the purpose of the assessment. But like I said, the answer is gonna depend a lot on the specific child. The evaluation is done, you have the report, you've had the meeting, um, and these are just some questions that I get from parents sometimes, so I, I just wanted to share them with you. So some parents are concerned, you know, now that the report is done and I share it with the school, is it gonna be, you know, is it gonna be a part of my kid's record? Any, any school they go to, any college they go to, is it gonna be shared? And uh, the answer is the evaluation report is considered protected health information. So if your child is a minor, um, you are the guardian of that information and you decide who sees the report. Um, the report is only shared with those who you have um, given written consent to share with. Okay, so this, your school, um, when your kid is applying to college, your kid's high school can't share that with the colleges, you know, so you have control over who sees the report. Um, okay, and then going back to, follow, you know, if you have, let's say you got the report, the evaluation process is done, and you still feel like you don't understand what um, the conclusions were, you don't understand the diagnoses, maybe you, um, something doesn't sit right with you or you disagree, um, then please talk with the provider, because that's part of their job, is to provide that clarification. Um, let's see, and then, okay, so the IEP and or SST meeting, you know, so the results, with your permission as the parent will be shared with the school and the provider will work with your school coming up with a plan. 
Um, let's see. So um, the other, you know, after the evaluation is done, it's, um, you know, it's up to the school and it's up to the parents to follow through with the action plan. Um, the provider can't do that for you. So if there, you know, if there is a recommendation for speech language therapy, family therapy, um, you know, we can give you referral sources, but it's up to you to follow through and um, contact those people for additional support. The evaluator, you know, it, that's exactly, it's just an evaluation. Um, there isn't uh, intervention. Intervention isn't typically part of the assessment process. Sorry, what is that, uh, So student support team. So some private schools, they, there's different language, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do colleges um, ask if the student has been given an IEP or a 504 plan? So you are not required to provide that information, and I don't think colleges are allowed, well, I don't know about private colleges, honestly, but I think they're, like, public colleges, they're not allowed to ask. It's voluntary if you provide that information or not. Private? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, but if your child needs support in college, it's probably going to benefit uh, them, your child to be transparent with wherever they're going to school. Because the, the last thing you want is a kid that's, that needs support, not get it, have a terrible first year, return home. I mean, we've seen that too. Um, at the same time, we've also seen kids that have gotten a lot of support through high school, and by the time they go to college, they're ready to go. So it depends on your kid. Um, and then this is important to know, typically um, if you're wanting school accommodations or standardized testing accommodations, um, an evaluation is good for three years. So let's say your child is, uh, you know, getting ready to take the SAT or ACT um, and they need accommodations, they will have needed the assessment to be within a three year uh, range in order to, for those, um, for the assessment to be considered. So, yes? And what about if the, 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 the kid is in college? Do, then do you have to reassess them midway through college since it's a four year? You mean when they're applying or while they're in college? While they're in college. Let's say uh, they get the triannual mm -hmm. or the assessment right at senior year. Yeah. And so by junior year of college, they will, mm -hmm. the three years would have lapsed. Yeah. So would you need, as a college student, have them be reassessed? That's a good question. So for college, for classroom accommodations, it depends on the school. But if they're going to take the GRE or the LSAT or you know something after college, they will need a reassessment. So any formal standardized testing, it needs to be within three years. If you have a child in private school, you can still seek a psychoeducational evaluation through the public school district. Yeah. It's just every three years, you don't have an annual thing for them as well. I think it would be really hard to get an annual assessment through the school district. But they, they should be doing, I mean, they, if your child is found to need services, well, actually, I'm, yeah, you probably could answer that better. I believe that the parent has to agree not to have the IEP. For it not to happen annually, if they're in a private school. Yeah. Doesn't matter. OK. Thank you. Yeah? What, what I've heard or seen is that um, for a triangle, you could request the public school to do it. When they offer you, there's certain things that you need to do. Oh, okay. Just on the hook to do, that. do the evaluation? Okay. They will do it yearly unless you ask them not to. Is that right? Okay. You can request a, an evaluation through the school district if your kid goes to a private school. Um, they will automatically assume that you want to meet every year to reevaluate the IEP, the IEP, but you can decline that. So you can just get the assessment without, because it, it wouldn't make sense to do an IEP meeting if your kid is staying at a private school. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. All right, so I mean, I my presentation was pretty short because I wanted to leave lots of time for questions. Um, but these are some resources, if you don't know about them already. Um, Understood.org is a great resource for parents about the IEP process, 504 process. Um, general information about learning disorders, mood disorders, ADHD. Uh, we have a huge resource library here on our website um, that has articles, past talks, PowerPoints um, about a huge, um, and they're, they're categorized by topic. Uh, Rights Law is also a great resource for information about um, 
IEPs and 504s and working with the public school system. And then we also have free 30-minute consultations here. You can call um, this number and set those up. So if you're you know, trying to decide you know, whether or not your child needs an assessment, um, one of our psychologists will um, provide you, can provide you with a consultation and kind of help guide you through that um, decision-making process. Yes? Uh, so I had a question. I'm a, so I'm a developmental optometrist. We see a lot of kids with learning and reading problems. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we'll do a visual information processing assessment. And so mm -hmm. these kids are the ones that are actually doing really well in school, like they're AD students. Mm -hmm. But homework takes longer. They're struggling with reading. They mm -hmm. have some self-esteem issues. And so we do a processing assessment. And you know, we'll look at phonemic awareness or do a screening for dyslexia. Obviously, we can't diagnose that. Mm -hmm. And our tests flag it. And so mm -hmm. usually I'll recommend doing a psychoed through the school district, but mm -hmm. then the school doesn't want to because the kid's not failing. Oh yeah. How mm -hmm. do you how do you handle a situation like that? Because our testing flags it. You know they have tracking issues, they have eye teaming issues. So yes, we can rectify that in clinic, but how do you handle the learning aspect? Because the school is going to say, well, your kid's not failing. So what do I tell the kid? Your kid is not failing. If you make a request to a school district to have your child evaluation evaluated right. by law. They are required to do it. They can't come back to you and say, oh, he's not failing. Oh, he's doing just fine. That's great. I'm glad he's doing just fine. However, the law requires that right. you have to provide an evaluation permission. Right. So do you have information or resources that I can yeah, show? Used to be the other way. So I end up like slots really good. The right slot, okay. Because yeah. a lot of times the parents end up doing private evaluations then, which is really costly for them. Or they'll do a school assessment and then they don't necessarily agree with it. And so then they do have to Then you can request an independent educational evaluation. So you can come down to CHC and get okay. a real one and then have that process. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and the school district will pay for the IEE. But it is, it is a process of advocating for your kid. I heard that if you do an outside evaluation, the school doesn't have to do the school district doesn't have to use. No, yeah. but they have by legally they have to consider, uh, take into account what is recommended and what is found in that outside evaluation. And the psychoeducational test they do in the school district is it different different districts, or there's like a set of ones they recommend. Every school district uh, provides. I know, but what do they do? That's what I want to know. It depends. It's, that's what, that's what I Yeah, wondering. it varies from district to district and probably from school psychologist to school psychologist from what I've seen. I've just seen a, a very broad range, kind of like in the private sector. It's like that too, but um, go ahead. What is used for IQ testing? Um, what is used instead of IQ testing for students that So uh, we, it, it's that, that's funny. We just had a big discussion about this in our with our clinical team. So if the kid is in a, Public school, we don't do I we won't do IQ testing. Um, some people will give the DOS, but even then, that's risky because that's considered a um, intelligence test. So there, um, there's a, a legal precedent uh, for African American students to that they are um, IQ tests are unfairly biased against them. So yeah, so school districts. Um, and private practitioners as well um, are are beholden to that precedent. So, you know, but you can still, I mean, but academic testing, attention, executive functioning, et cetera, we still assess that. And then my comments, um, one of them is um, it's critical for parents to remember and stress that they are part of the IEP team mm -hmm. and not in addition to the IEP team. Mm -hmm. You are as critical part of that team in making decisions as are the teacher and the um, evaluators. Yes. Yes. And you, you have to, if you don't sign off on it, then the plan isn't going to go through. Right. So like you never session. sign off at the first meeting. You have to read it and yeah. you have to go over it and then you go back to it. Um, the yes. other comment is, um, <laughs> especially in Santa Clara County, I don't know about San Diego, San Diego, San Diego. Each area has a community advisory committee for special education, which is a committee that is just, um, mandated by law to be a part of um, developing and evaluating and making recommendations to the school boards about the special ed programs in the district. I did. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Okay. Do, do, you, two, do you know two E? Yes. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Who do you go to get evaluation? You mean if you want extra support? 
yeah. or but to find out exactly what is strength, what is weakness of the knee. So, so could, is yeah. there someone who diagnoses? It? Yeah. It's not a diagnosis. It is a label to identify kids that are intellectually gifted but have also have um, a significant weakness in a certain area. So it might be a very intellectually gifted kid with ADHD or depression or um, dyslexia. Um, 2E, twice exceptional, is not a category for eligibility within the public school district. So you're not going to, I mean, you're not going to get that that labeling. We uh, provide 2E testing here. Oh, really? uh, Morrissey Compton, I think, does as well. Um, but with the school district, you know, legally, they're not obligated to provide extra support to gifted kids, unless their, you know, their other E is low. They have ADHD, mm -hmm. and, that, and they qualify under other health impairments, which are mm -hmm. services. Then they, mm -hmm. and, and ADHD is a qualifier. So an audiologist would make that diagnosis. Most psychologists don't have training, and um, but it's an audiologist. But it's very important, um, and. Just best practice is that the, audio, the audiology assessment go hand in hand with a speech language assessment. Those are always supposed to go hand in hand. Not the audiologist alone. That evaluation provides very limited information, and it's it's easy to misinterpret without the information from a speech language pathologist. So best practice is that it should always be with a speech language pathologist. Yeah. Yes. So um, looking at the. Uh, the titles that you mentioned in the report, and you're talking about various, uh, you're talking about intelligence, attention, mm -hmm. and all of those. Why doesn't it include any behavioral comments so or any? The behavioral, sorry. Yes, any part that tests the behavioral issues or whatever. So that, um, that's a great question. So this is specifically the results section. So this is the results of the actual tests you give. Um, that the information, so there is going to be some information about the kids' behavior from the rating scales and stuff, but um, another big part of the assessment, and I'm sorry I didn't include it here, is um, behavioral observation. So in the testing room, at school, as reported, by, so we also interview teachers and parents and whoever works with the kids that have known them for you know extended period of time. So that is included usually um, up near the, um, right before the, the results section, there's usually a behavioral section as well. Thanks for asking about that. Yeah. So a lot of the times, um, if I want to go in depth into behavioral support that it has with me, mm -hmm. I mean, I could go to the DCBA, but I, <laughs> my experience has said that it's, it's severely lacking in depth uh, and even you competence in, some, in a lot of the cases, uh -huh. the behavioral recommendations. And Are you talking specifically like ABA, CBT? Um, no, so okay. that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. I, okay. I, I don't want to be, uh, I want to understand what is the best route that, that I should take to help my child if he has behavioral issues. And I don't want to go to a BCBA. Yeah. A BCBA who would end up recommending their ABA that I don't yeah. know that's right. <coughs> Functional behavior, behavior assessment. But I, I think your question is if there is a behavior problem, what is the best type of therapy to address that behavior problem? Um, that's another question. Given all of the other other things that may be going on, uh -huh. or the strengths yeah. that you may have, yeah. and, and the intellectual level, yeah. the child's personality, um, what they respond more to. Yeah, that's all things that the psychologist. The psychologist should be making, whoever did the assessment should be answering that question, you know, instead of just saying get behavioral support. There should be, I mean, the result, the recommendation should be very tailored to your child. Um, when I do an evaluation, my goal is um, I treat it like a, a research project with an N of one. So my job is to become an expert on the kid. Um, and in that process, having a really good sense of, you know what, this kid would be much better off with a cognitive behavioral therapist than a psychodynamic therapist, or this kid was, would not respond well to ABA, but you know would respond you know better to this, or you know group therapy versus individual. So those are those are questions that the the psychologist should really be thinking about. Um, and then I, I also want to plug our, our thirty minute consultation again. If you you know that's also available too if you're needing looking for guidance there. Yeah, go ahead. About if you have a child who's in, in high 
closest to high school is their senior year. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to have a triannual, but it's close to the end of the year. Can the district time out out of the assessment fees? Because you can write a letter to the district asking to perform the planning the budget. Because three years is their maximum right. they have to wait. So you can have it done after the first year. You just have to write a letter. Oh, okay. But, then if you're but if it's due before graduation, yes, there's it's still mandated to have it. Now they're going to drag it on from you because they're going to have it because once they receive their diploma. Yeah, because so uh, yeah, because the situation that's happened with my son is that we are at the triannual. It's supposed to happen in um, April, but um, I'm asking for certain assessments in terms of the processing mm -hmm. and, and the intellect and a lot of what they want to do is just review records which then I'm looking into accommodations for college because then he needs to have current information so that the colleges can give him the same accommodations that he's receiving at the school but they're telling me that it's not a disability it's not his disability so we're going into this whole thing of they want to do minimal like mm -hmm. trying to come out at this point <coughs> like this last year doing minimal um, assessment and so I know for the initial assessment, they're required to um, do assessments for every area of concern. I don't know if that's the same with tribe. I know it's the same thing. So when you get the written report that says you're going to do this test, this test, this right. test, you write it on there and you say, I want this test, this test, this test, this test. Or say, I'm also concerned about his ability to do this. Yeah. Um, well, I tried was, doing that and they told me it's not his area of disability and so they're just. If you have budget. a suspected issue, which means by law they have the issues out of it. And if they told you no, ask them for prior written for prior written notice. Yeah. They have to just say put it right over you. And they're also they're also educational advocates mm -hmm. that can provide support to you. Um, I don't does rights law have a list of advocates? No, parents helping parents. Parents Helping Parents is a, thank you. Yeah, so that's a great resource if you're looking for an advocate to help you deal with the school district, which can be challenging at times. Did you have a question? I do. Um, so is the Council of Parents Advocates. Mm -hmm. They will, but they're, they're national. Okay, so COPA and Parents Helping Parents. Go ahead. Um, one question, uh, two questions. One about um, private evals. What would you, how, could you describe the difference between a psychological evaluation Sure. And my yeah. Question is about um, CHC, and we to like offer sliding scales for. We do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really quick front and back application, and we usually get back to you within two weeks. And if you want, you can inquire about the sliding scale before you schedule testing to see mm -hmm. um, where you are on the scale. Yeah, um, and that form is available on our website. Um, oh, sorry. I'm Oh, I'm a learning specialist, and I'm trying to help parents um, navigate where they can get their uh, evals done. And for some of my families that um, need some financial support, I was wondering if they offer for uh, if they because when they're going the private route most most frequently because the students there work for the adults would not qualify for special education services. Does the CHC still exist? Um, at our community clinic, we do. Yeah. So there's a the center which is private pay um, with a sliding scale, and then there's um, the community clinic um, that accepts Medi-Cal. The one in San Jose is the community clinic, right? We also see community clinic um, clients here, yeah. Uh, and then you had it, what was your second question? No, oh, yes, that's a tricky one. Um, I'll be honest with you, there isn't a clean line between psychologists and neuropsychologists. Um, when someone refers to themselves as a psychologist versus a neuropsychologist, it usually goes back to their training. Um, so, for so to to be a neuropsychologist, um, ideally, you um, after you're getting your PhD, you get extensive training, extra training in neuropsychology. So that's a formal two-year postdoc where you're supposed to do neuropsychological assessments with a broad variety of um, kids with a broad variety of medical and psychiatric issues, um, well, or adults, depending on what you're specializing in. Um, in addition to that clinical experience, you're also supposed to be getting um, formal didactic training for two years in uh, neuroanatomy, um, different uh, neurological disorders, um, so it, it, there's, a, Definitely, I mean, most of these postdocs are in medical centers because there's a big medical um, kind of a emphasis. 
So anyway, uh, anyone that's gone through that training will typically call themselves a neuropsychologist. Um, and then psychologists uh, usually do not have that formal two-year post. So these postdocs have to be approved by a certain, certain board of neuropsychology. Um, and then psychologists, they may have training in neuropsychology, but it may not be in one of those formal programs. Uh, it's tricky because you can have some psychologists that are actually really great at doing neuropsychological assessments because of their experience. They just don't have the formal uh, technical training. Um, and then how could y'all differ? Would the neuropsychologists offer a more cognitive description, more medical terms? Or it depends on the it depends on the provider, mm -hmm. which makes it so tricky. So the best, I mean, for me, the I the best way that when I refer is. Um, Getting, trying to get it uh, by by word of mouth, you know, hearing what the what um, what they provide. I'll often ask for a sample report to see typically what they assess and how deeply they analyze the information, and do uh, do my recommendations based off of that. Because it's just it's really if someone like I said, it's just impossible to know the what the quality of their work is going to be like just based on that title. Unfortunately, that's where we're at right now. Is there a governing body that says? you cannot diagnose this unless you are a neuropsych or, or I mean, cause yeah, school, good question. I know that school psychologists, at least what I think I know is that they formally can't diagnose. They can say if a child presents symptoms similar to, or can they? Yeah. So most, um, so within a school district, they will not provide a diagnosis, but there are private practitioners that are school psychologists that will, because they had some, tr they had the training under a psychologist. Um, yeah. So Did, there's no governing body that says. That so, says so it's not, I mean, it's not legal. So there is a, a the AB, PPCN, American Board of Professional Psychology dash clinical neuropsychology that has guidelines that um, and that's the board that they're trying to beef up the board certification process. But in reality, it, you know, uh, the APA doesn't distinguish and the licensing board, you know, so we all have PhDs or PsyDs in clinical psychology. Um, yeah, that's, it's very confusing. Um, you had your hand up. So I'm wondering where the school, where, where the school of psychology is in versus the psychologist and the neuropsychologist. Huh. And then also the schools will hold you, hold, put you in a, in a double place where they say, we won't diagnose, but we won't accept a medical diagnosis for autism. What do you mean? They won't. They, they, they won't accept can't diagnose. Uh -huh. But when you come to them with medical diagnosis, uh -huh. they say that's a medical diagnosis. Okay. So then, if you come to them with a like a evaluation done by a psychologist, does that make a difference? Nope. Oh. Okay. I don't know how to answer that question. So that's as far as. Um, then the reasoning is the child may have a medical condition, but if it does not interfere with learning, and in this we, we see that mm -hmm. it's actually interfering with learning, we won't be providing services just because there is a medical mm -hmm. condition. That's, that's the reason. I thought autism was one of the 13 categories. Yes, but they have by, to. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. They decide that it's yeah. not affecting their learning. Yeah. In, in the yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. school, they don't provide it. Okay. I think um, the part that the parent needs to do in order to be able to, to have them be labeled as autistic is that they need to show some of the trademarks of it. And it's important that the parent get in touch with the teacher in terms of letting them know some of the obsessive compulsive behaviors that they, they are doing so that, that the teacher can then see it within the classroom. And then once you're in the meeting, you could see those traits and so therefore they can uh, then label them as autistic because otherwise if you just go with the diagnosis itself it's not sufficient it needs to be shown within the the classroom within the learning environment but in order for that to happen the teacher needs to be more aware of what those trademarks are what their obsessive behaviors are so that that way she starts or she or he starts noticing them in the classroom uh, because otherwise the teacher will just not necessarily necessarily notice it because you have so many students at that time that those little things are not noticeable until the parent points it out, then they start seeing the child having that repetitive behavior and it then becomes more apparent to them, which then helps at the IEP. Yeah, I, I personally haven't come across that issue before, so sorry I can't speak to it, but thank you for your, your input. Go ahead. I also have a couple of questions. Um, 
what is it the school report doesn't uh, diagnose? Can you bring your school report to CHC for a second opinion without having to redo the IQ, redo all of that you stuff? You can? Especially yeah. Just like within a year. Like just a consultation? Um, you absolutely can. Um, and then I'm, I, I'm sure part of the discussion then would be, is this evaluation sufficient or do you need to get a, an outside evaluation? Um, but yeah, that's, that's absolutely something that you can, you can do before deciding to like, book another assessment. Yeah. My question actually, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's kind of related to yours by saying that what if, so I understand that history is very important and all the previous uh, reports are extremely important, but what if you wanted to kind of get that second opinion without kind of having to provide this do you think it's a good idea or what what is you mean without the history so yeah that's a great question okay wait so your your question is um you want a second opinion will the history like maybe color or misinform that's yeah they like this my opinion um, so if I were to do a consultation I wouldn't just rely on the report I would be asking you as well you know, because, yeah, it happens sometimes that um, a school district or anyone's report doesn't reflect what the parent's recollection or the parent's report. So, um, I mean, as an evaluator, history carries just as much weight as the test results. Um, so it's really important for us to have a clear, to the best of our ability, get a clear understanding of the history to make any, to give any kind of opinion. Does that answer your question? So who's, oh, you, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. So um, this is a quick question, and then I just want to have a question. Um, how important is it for a provider to have, quote, unquote, experience with gifted population if that's what's been recommended to you? Or do oh. you feel like a good clinician can? A com yeah, I mean, most clinicians, most child assessment psychologists will have experience um, with gifted kids. Um, if they don't, uh, you know, the problem is, and you know, the more experience you have, the more you know about resources, um, you know, the more you know about what, what recommendations work for these kids. Um, so, I mean, I think it is important to, to find a provider that does have experience. Most of them will, but you should ask, you know, that, yeah. And then the other uh, question I was wondering is, does the normal uh, psychoed or neuropsych evaluation have all the information you need to tease out whether a child may have dyslexia or dysgraphia or oral language mm -hmm. expression disorder? Or do you then recommend uh, further testing to tease out? OK, that's a good question. So. Um, <laughs> This is how I was trained, and so this is how I believe a good evaluator should go about an assessment. Um, there are tests that are very broad in their scope. Start with those. Um, based on the results of that, you zero in on the areas that need uh, closer attention or closer analysis. So you kind of narrow your focus based on what comes out from those broader assessments. Does that make sense? So it should. Um, using that approach, you should be addressing um, those areas of weakness that maybe either um, you know parents and teachers are seeing, or sometimes there are areas of weakness that no one has observed that you you kind of tease out based on that broader assessment first, and then kind of narrowing in. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so when you come to CHC, uh -huh. is it like there's a certain flat rate for the testing, or is it a la carte, like every? It's per hour. They we charge per hour here. So if there's a more intense evaluation that's required, um, then yeah, you'll be billed per hour. Um, and we also do team assessments here. So let's say um, you know, the, there's a concern about um, you know, a learning disability, but then there's also a concern that there may be a speech or language delay. Depending, um, the psychologist may decide, oh, if it's, um, if it's complex enough, they will bring in a speech language pathologist to do that testing, for example. Um, you talked a little bit about price exceptional. Is that how is that different from stealth dyslexia? Stealth dyslexia? Can you explain what stealth dyslexia is? A lot of our parents have been coming in with diagnoses that their child has stealth dyslexia. So they're really intelligent, uh -huh. but they specifically have trouble in like one aspect of reading. Okay. okay. And so I wasn't sure how it's different from 2E. 
2E is a very broad umbrella term. So it's the high intelligence and then just one, one or two areas of yeah discrepancy. So it could be reading, it could be ADHD, it could be emotional. Right. Yeah. I never heard stealth dyslexia. Yeah, has anyone else ever heard of that? I haven't heard that one. Yeah, you've heard of it? It's, it's, it's basically a subset of 2E, right? So 2E yeah. is the really bright, right. and then you have something else. Oh, then stealth dyslexia, if you're really bright, then you have dyslexia. So confusing. But it's called stealth because it's sneaky, like, you know, it's coming. <laughs> so the reading is average, but their intelligence is superior. Uh huh. Oh, got it. Got it. But isn't that like, isn't that how kids with two E are somewhat like two E kids can be like that too, right? Because they can they have a complex thing. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. So the stealth dyslexia, they have a dyslexia. Yeah. But they they've been compensating, so no one's kind of noticed it. It's like snuck up. Okay. I like that term. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to word this well. Um, just in the parents that I've met, known, and kids, it seems like at an early age you know a certain amount, and as they grow and mature and gaps widen or close, then then things kind of morph and change. Like I know kids that you know early on have one or two diagnoses, but then later on they get a couple more, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, and that's the case for my son. It seems like every few years you get a new diagnosis. So oh. I guess what I'm trying to ask is when do you, do you know that, okay, this is what we're dealing with yeah. or, yeah. or when do you know, that's, yeah, I should get a great. second opinion. Cause yes. I, we just had a neuropsych done two years ago and here we are not by THC, but we're at mm -hmm. THC today getting another one done because there's this big hole that hasn't been mm -hmm. answered. So mm -hmm. that is such a great question. Um, so neuropsych testing, unfortunately, it's not like a blood test that comes out positive or negative. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things that, they're in the end, they're behavioral diagnoses, meaning that to meet criteria for a diagnosis, um, your child has to, some kind of behavioral symptom has to emerge. Um, so for example, for ADHD, uh, you know, difficulty sustaining attention, difficulty organizing your activities, um, difficulty planning ahead. Uh, so sometimes those problems don't emerge until the kid is in junior high when they're taking multiple classes, you know, maybe their, their class period has extended. So those weaknesses are being taxed and now they meet criteria because now they're in an environment where they're struggling. Does that make sense? Um, so, but when do you know, like, when is too much neuropsych testing enough? Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, obviously if there's a big hole that hasn't been addressed. I guess that, I mean, I just, I don't know. I'm, you know, struggling with that because I, I don't know that necessarily we're going to get more services, but we might just have general questions answered. Yeah. I have five who all have IEPs. Yeah. All have been reevaluated probably every two years. Okay. Every two years. Yeah. So let me tell you that every time we come in, it works. So you're not alone in that. Let me know why. It's because they change. Yeah. Right. Hormones kick in. Yeah. Puberty. Everything changes, right? Yeah. So then you've got some who's like, I have one who's on the extreme end of ADHD, right? And we came here and we did all our evaluations. She was like, I don't even have a test to give them into this box right here. So come back in two years and then we're going to look at this again, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be an ongoing process because he's going to change. Mm -hmm. And all those things are going to change, right? Mm -hmm. And some things you kind of, they learn how to outgrow, right? So ADHD is always going to be there, but some of that OCD-ness, right? What looks like OCD now doesn't, isn't really OCD, it's just the way that they're managing that behavior. Mm -hmm. So then it keeps changing and working. You know, what I'm thinking is that uh, this evaluation is going to help your child. I think that's a baseline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By having this evaluation, it's going to help your child in some way, finding a mentor. And we can talk more after, yeah, too. Just, yeah. I mean, I just, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. Uh, OK, I haven't heard from you yet. So maybe you and then you. OK. New subject, kind of. So looking at the. Um, so there's the, I, the way of, I've always thought of these evaluations is there's the intelligence testing and then there's the academic testing and you kind of see where, you know, if there's a mm -hmm. discrepancy, right? Like that's mm -hmm. coming from the public school model. So mm -hmm. um, my question is kind of about, like, does the intelligence change? So for instance, yeah, my son has question. had, he, you know, he was tested 
three years ago. He's coming up on his triennial. He'll do this whole battery test again. Both my kids are dyslexic. He's more severely dyslexic than my daughter, who's more moderate, who doesn't get any services or anything she has a 504. But for her, um, she had a like a neuropsych, the full battery a few years ago. I don't really want to go through all that again with her, but I definitely want to zero in on like how is she doing academically and like where are those weaknesses? Can mm -hmm. you like separate it that way or is it like do you always need the gold standard of yeah, the tricky, so intelligence doesn't change, but for various reasons, the scores can change. Okay, so, I mean, now we're going into psychometrics. So, um, the WIPSI, which is for uh, ages 2 to 7, uh, was based on a different normative sample than the WISC, which is from ages 6 to 16, which is based on a different sample than the adult test. So, that's one reason why the scores can change. Um, the other thing is there's something called the regression to the mean, where as kids get older, um, so when kids are younger, there is more variability in their skills, okay? So, um, but as, as they progress, as they get older, they tend to catch up with each other. So oftentimes you'll see a kid that is in, uh, you know, maybe has an intelligence of 124 when they were four, and then by the time they're 14, it's uh, maybe like 110. And that's because they were, they were ahead of the curve when they were four, and then as they got older, some of their peers that were behind caught up to them, and now they're more closer, closer to the middle. So there are a couple reasons why um, that IQ number changes, um, and that's why most, uh, it, it makes, from my perspective, it makes sense to redo the intelligence assessment because I, I can't count on that number from three years ago to be the same as um, Today. They already have a diagnosis. You're not. Is that what mm -hmm. that number is kind of used for to find that discrepancy? If they already have a diagnosis, then well, it depends on your. I guess it depends on the the goal of like what you're looking for. So you're not looking for a rediagnosis. You just want to know if they've made progress. Yeah, or like yeah. kind of to hone in more on like okay, so the like for my son, like huh, some of these interventions mm -hmm. aren't working as well as yeah. we would think. So like, yeah. is there something else going on there? Yeah, yeah. Um, can that be separated from the full neuro? Yeah. Like portion. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to go about that is go to the go back to the person that evaluated him, however many years ago, for a reassessment. That would make the most sense, right? It's going to be a little harder. I mean, you can make that request to a new provider, um, but they may have their preference to like, well, I want to do my testing. I haven't met your child before. I need you know more information versus going to the person that tested them the first time. So. And then mm. a second follow up question is, I was told I. So I heard you said every three years for accommodations for testing. Uh -huh. um, I was told that for like SATs, they, uh -huh. they need to be 16 because of the intelligence testing. So they need to be 16 to get college accommodations. For a lot, not every college, but a lot of colleges. So um, if there's a teenager that is looking for college accommodations, we like to wait till they're 16 so that we can give them the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale which some colleges require. So some colleges will not look at the Wexler intelligence scale for children. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah so it's for a co college accommodations. The SAT will take the WISC. SAT will take WISC, which is the three. The, chi the, the six to 16 okay. age range. Yeah, okay. that's a good question. Yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah, so I was just wondering, do public, so I have a kid in fifth grade, trying to always been a private school. That's where I'm probably to public school okay. um, for middle school. Do they, I have a million neuropsych exam because of an underlying medical issue. Yeah. Do they accept those? Do I just show up at the so, public school and they're going to take them? Or more yeah. I'll speak from my experience and then I'm sure you all have something you can add. But um, for me, uh, I, it depends on the school district. I've had some districts say, hey, we'll just take the neuropsych, your neuropsych evaluation. Have other districts say, we want to do our testing in addition to considering outside evaluation. So it depends on your district. Do you have anything to add to that? You have much more experience um, in the district. Do you have an IEP currently in a private school? Um, or SST. So then when you request it, it's easy um, assessment plan. Oh, no. At that point, that I think would be helpful for them because you don't want them to have a oh to not see the whole picture. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then just to quick follow. So do I hand? Do I get them all of the neuropsych testing that we've had? Yeah. Copies. Copies. Yeah. Yes. What's your opinion of um, taking the doing the evaluation 
without ADHD medication on board mm -hmm. because when you do well on them, then the school will say you don't qualify <coughs> under their health impaired, we don't see any problems. Mm -hmm. But when you're off medication, you're gonna see it. On yeah. So that's a gr that's a great question. Um so I, I always test on medication unless the very specific, if the question is, does the medication work? <laughs> then it's appropriate to test off medication, then test on medication. But usually the question is, what supports does my kid need to succeed in school? So I will test on medication. Medication doesn't solve everything. As you probably have parents, with, you probably have kids with ADHD in here somewhere, right? So you know that. Um, it will help with the inattention, it'll help with the focus, but once the medication wears off, there's homework, right? Um, it typically doesn't help with uh, social, uh, or I'm sorry, with, yeah, sometimes it doesn't help much, I mean, it usually doesn't help much with the social piece or the emotional regulation. It also doesn't really help too much with executive functioning. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I advise um, testing on medication and getting a good, well for me, getting a good history, knowing what the kid was like before they were on medication, what the parents observe what the kid is like when they're not on medication, um, and also pointing to the data. I mean, whenever I test a kid with ADHD on medication, they may do fine on the sustained attention tests, but there's always a weakness in executive functioning that's still present because the medication doesn't treat that. Um, and just you know, kind of educating the reader Yes, this kid's on medication. Yes, it's helping in these areas, but he's still showing the typical presentation of ADHD with challenges with organization and planning and things like that. So, yes. One of my children, uh, when I was talking to the school about when we assess it, I'm worried something is not going right now. And I said, I think it's because of ADHD that he's having some difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, and their response was, well, we don't see any of that in school. So I said, yes, without a sentence. <laughs> That's great. Um, any other questions? Yes? So I have a daughter who has ADHD, and I have a son who has an IEP, but she's coming up to possibly get an IEP. Is there a test for like, processing speed or working memory or uh -huh. that I should be asking for? Uh, you mean from the school? Yeah, from the school. Like, you know, you can write in that section which test. So the, the Wexler, so they'll probably give a Wexler, well, hopefully they would give a Wexler intelligence scale for children and that has a processing speed index and a working memory index. Yeah. I don't think you can actually request the specific test, test but yeah. you can say what you want tested, and they then can choose what mm -hmm. testing method is. And tell them what they're concerned about. Yeah. So they're not bound to use the specific test. Did you have a question? Go ahead. Yes, sorry. Okay. We just had our triannual this morning, so this is kind of timing. So we're still kind of new to this. So he, he, was, he was diagnosed with fifth grade, so we had to so I'm still kind of confused between what the school psychologist in terms of diagnosis. So okay. initially, his initial assessment was he had a medical diagnosis of ADHD, and then the school psychologist, so his uh, eligibility for special ed was just his writing, um, self-advocacy, um, um, study, study skills and organization. Okay. Writing has been a real challenge since kindergarten. Uh -huh. So now the assessment results come back. And so now they're listing it as just so eligibility for special ed. We have other help. OHI. OHI. Uh -huh. um, and they've taken off writing and they've taken off the self advocacy. They left study skills as the only check mark for. Um, and I'm not sure. So, they, so the school psychologist said yesterday that she doesn't think that has a learning disability. So can you not have a learning disability after having been Did you sign your IEP? Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about like, so on your paperwork, right? You've got your diagnosis and this OHI. And underneath that, there's like three categories or three lists for check boxes. So go back and say, I just want to make sure you didn't make an error because I'm noticing that on this, these aren't listed as issues. She's saying that there is no, there is no special, there is no learning disability. What is his Jenna teacher? Uh, Jenna, case manager? Yeah. No, his teacher. Are you all, so we had a question. Are you all from PHP? From us? 
Yeah. yeah. No, we just oh, okay. Parent advocates that. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it was a good question. I'm curious. I was curious as well. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? So what if, um, so my, my child goes to a private school, and what if you disagree with the, uh, the, the academic levels that they're talking about? So you think that he needs to be held back, and mm -hmm. he needs to be, so who would be the person? Do we specifically go to an academic, Sorry. Like a learning specialist. Yes, specialist. yes. Is that or should should be psychologists that's the and all of these other things yeah. that could help there? I mean, I, I think in that situation the title doesn't matter as much as, you know, if it's a good evaluator. So I would uh, you know, ask around. I mean, of course, I think CHC, our assessment psychologists here are great, but, um, you know, you know, if you're looking outside of CHC too, asking around and just um, people with, assessors with a good reputation. Um, yeah. I don't necessarily have to go to the academic lecturers. It could be. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it might depend on your school too. Um, they may take a psychologist's opinion more seriously than and ed therapist for whatever reason, um, but I would I would ask them to to make sure you're yeah they'll they'll consider the assessment. It's I think it's harder with public private schools yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Okay. Yes. My son was trying to do this kind of auditory process. If by the school psychologist, but oh. Yeah. 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 Was there a speech therapist in the on the evaluation team? There might have been. But I always thought that, that it was dyslexia. <laughs> but we let's talk after. So that diagnosis, the CAPD, is very it's very controversial for good reason. Um, that's a whole other talk. Um, but let's talk about that and it because um, let's talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, here two questions. So how long does it take to get an appointment? Like we went today, is it three months out? Four months? I think we're actually, I think yeah. we're taking appointments here relatively soon. I don't think it's as, we've, we've recently hired some more assessment psychologists, so um, we're, being, we're able to get families in quicker here. Here's the goal. That, so I went through an assessment with a private person, and I, two weeks passed by, and I know it's a huge thing. I said, okay, maybe three weeks, it'll be done. And she, the report? She's like, uh, four to six weeks. I'm like, well, school's um, going to be almost over by then. What's yeah. your term is around time? Here it's uh, four weeks. Yeah. I mean, I because you're seeing several kids, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's a big council. Yeah. yeah, we always provide a one-page summary of, of the results and uh, recommendations.